Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Adam Rappaport, and I'm the medical director of the Pediatric Advanced Care Team at the Hospital for Sick Children, as well as the medical director of Emily's House Children's Hospice in Toronto, Canada. It is an honor for me to be here with you today to talk about how do we speak to children about illness, death, and dying. As far as objectives go for today, we're gonna reflect on that strong desire that all adults have to protect children, and instead, we'll discuss the benefits of preparing them, as well as their families, when someone in their life is dying. In addition, we're gonna examine the principles of communicating with children about illness, dying, and grief, and we'll learn strategies to address some of their common questions and concerns. And finally, I'm gonna introduce you to what we call in Toronto, the six C's and the three W's. First, a few disclosures. I have no financial or any other conflicts of interest. But I do wanna share with you that the things we're gonna be talking about today, the concepts, the ideas, they are not my own. I've had the opportunity to learn myself from great people and uh, work with great people all the time who have lots of expertise in talking to children. I'm gonna share with you today some of the things that I've learned from them and I've had the opportunity to build on. And of course, I'm gonna share with you some of the things from the medical literature as well. The other disclosure I wanna to make to you is that although I've been working with children and talking about serious illnesses for many, many years, I still get nervous when it comes to having difficult conversations about illness and death with children. This is only natural. These are not easy conversations. It takes a lot of practice, and it's always uncomfortable to have these, these discussions. So who is this talk for? Well, I think it's for anyone who works with seriously ill children. This, of course, could be pediatric palliative care physicians like myself, but it could be pediatric cardiologists, neurologists, uh, it could be intensivists, and of course, any multidisciplinary staff who work in these areas as well. Of course, this talk is relevant for anybody who works with siblings of seriously ill children. I also think this talk is very relevant to those who work with dying adults where there might be children in the home. So this could be adult palliative care clinicians, but it could be those of you working in emergency departments or intensive care or any other medical field that might be dealing with adults who have a serious illness and are nearing death. Finally, I would say that this is a relevant discussion for anyone who might have children in their home who one day may be faced with the death of a loved one. So, where does my story begin? I believe it really begins at a place called Camp Aaron. Before I started working at Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto, I got my start at a place called the Maxim Beatrice Wolf Children's Center, which focused a lot on helping grieving children. These are children that lost a brother or sister or a parent. And once a year, we held an event called Camp Aaron. This was a really magical experience. We took 70 bereaved children up to a beautiful camp space in Northern Ontario. Picture all the green grass and trees, a beautiful lake. Children would go canoeing, play baseball, arts and crafts, lots of fun activities. But in the middle of all that as well, there were opportunities to talk about the person they lost and to focus on their grief and receive some therapy. It was a perfect mix. One of my roles at Camp Aaron was a program that was called Ask the Doctor. And this is exactly what it sounds like. Basically, it was a chance for the kids at camp to ask the doctor, me, any questions that they might have. And the truth was, anything goes. What I was convinced at the time, what I was told rather, is that these children many of them had never had an opportunity to speak with a physician and hear exactly about the illness or the medical problem or even the social problem that led to their loved one's death. And they had a lot of questions about illness, about things like suicide, about death, 
and about grief. And uh, basically, this was an opportunity to speak to a professional. At the beginning of camp, when the children arrived, they were all given a pink slip of paper and a magic marker. And they were told over the course of the weekend that they have an opportunity to write their questions down. And on the final day of camp, the physician, me, would answer their questions. The questions were all anonymous. And although they could ask anything, most of the kids were focused on the issues related to serious illness, death, and dying. I said, okay, what could go wrong? I'm sure I could handle this. I'm a pediatrician. And so I sat down and I had some time to review the questions just before it was time to speak to the children. And I stared at the first question. And here's what I saw. If God is real, why would he not let whoever has passed choose if they want to die themselves? It was at that moment that I knew I was in way over my head. How am I supposed to answer this question? Fortunately for me, I worked with incredible children's grief counselors, and they helped me figure out ways to answer this and all the other questions that I faced. And today I'm going to share with you some of the things that I learned from them and others along the way. Let's begin by talking about the scope of the problem. Ken Doka, who is the editor of the Journal of Death and Dying, has been quoted as saying that one in five children will experience the death of someone close to them by the time they're age 18. This is not a small problem. This affects a lot of kids. And we know that even though most children in the long run will do okay, many of them have an increased chance of physical illness, such as sleep problems, eating issues and uh, weight loss, enuresis or bedwetting, and psychological issues like depression and anxiety. What I would say is if there's something that we can do to help children in their grief, we owe it to them to make it better. So the question is then, what can we do, if anything at all, to make it better? Indeed, there's actually been quite a lot of literature and research in this area. There are many studies looking at ways that we can support children when they are dying themselves, when they have a brother or sister in their life who's dying, or when there is a parent or an adult in their life who's dying. And what I'd like to do is share with you sort of my summary of what all the literature seems to show. The bottom line is that any intervention that involves a purposeful, open, honest, and sincere communication with a child is going to lead to a better outcome. The fact of the matter is just talking to children in any way can help. It doesn't matter if you're speaking to a child before the death of their loved one or after the death of their loved one. It doesn't matter if it's one-on-one -on -one or in a group setting. It doesn't matter if it's in a school or a hospital, a clinic, or a camp like Camp Aaron. The point is, if an adult takes the time to speak with a child and address their fears and worries and support them through this difficult time, they're going to do better. The trouble, of course, is that there seem to be so many reasons not to talk to children about serious illness, death, and dying. And I put a few of them here on the slide. We need to protect children from emotional pain. If I tell them, they're going to think about it all the time. If a child isn't talking about it, then neither should we. Some children don't wish to know the truth. They're too young, or it's really best to avoid the D word, death. These are many of the excuses that I've heard over the years why we shouldn't be talking about these things with children. And I have to say, some of them I thought about as well. But in fact, all of these things are myth. Myths, excuse me. Let's debunk them together right now. The first myth is we need to protect children from emotional pain. It is natural when a child is very sick or someone in the house is very sick that the adults around the children will put on a mask, sort of a brave face, and pretend and look like everything is A-OK. -okay. This is, of course, because adults want to protect children from difficult situations. 
The problem is that there are some things in life we just cannot protect children from. The best thing that we can do is prepare them. When we put on this brave face and act like everything's okay, and a child is feeling worried or scared and has questions, unfortunately, it sometimes sends the message to the child that this is not something that we can talk about. This is out of bounds. And it makes the child feel isolated and alone. It is much better to open up the conversation and give them a chance to talk about these things. The next myth is if I tell them, they're going to be thinking about it all the time. I'd like to read a quote from Julie Stokes, who works at Winston's Wish. Julie said, for adults, grief is like wading through this enormous river. Whereas for children, it's like puddle jumping. But when they're in that puddle, it's no different from being in that river. I think these are very wise words. For those of us as adults who have ever grieved for someone we love, it really is like trying to cross a body of water to the other side. We can walk across, we see the other side, but that water is right up to our necks and pushing against us. And it's so hard and so slow to keep moving across and move forward. But for children, grief is like jumping in and out of puddles. When they're in it, it feels just as bad as when adults are going through grief. But sometimes they're out of it. They're playing, they're having fun. In fact, I would say one of the most common uh, concerns that parents have with, uh, and share with me after they've disclosed to a child that someone is nearing death or is going to die, they'll say, you know, Adam, I don't think my child really gets it. They were very sad when I first told them, but the day later, they seem to be back to normal. They're playing with their brothers and sisters. They're going to school and having fun. This is how children grieve in chunks. This is very normal. Rarely do we see children thinking about it all the time, sad all the time. When this is the case, it often makes us a little bit more concerned that maybe there are underlying mental health issues as well that need support. The next myth is, if a child isn't talking about it, neither should we. Just because a child isn't talking about an illness, death or dying, does not mean that they're not thinking about it. This myth reminds me of a story I once read in a medical journal called Pediatrics. This is the Journal of the American Association of Pediatrics. A physician once wrote a story in a 1981 uh, copy of the journal about a child that was admitted to the hospital with a very large abdomen that was filled with fluid. And the physicians were trying to figure out exactly what was going on. Every day, the medical team would come in the room and they would examine the child's belly. And then, in front of the child, they would talk to the parents. One day, the child turned to his mother and father and said, I know what's going on. I do understand why I'm here. And the parents said, really? Tell us, what do you think is happening? And he said, I'm here because there's a demon in my belly. A demon, like an evil spirit. The parents looked at him oddly and said, where did you get such an idea? Why do you think that? And he said, because I heard the doctor talking to you. The parents were so confused, and then it dawned on them that every day that the physicians would come in and speak to them, they were talking about edema. That's the medical term for fluid, edema, in the child's belly. But the child, of course, didn't understand the word edema, and tried to make sense of the situation with something that he did know and thought that the doctor was saying a demon. As you can see, when children don't understand things, when there's gaps in their understanding, they will naturally try to fill in those gaps with things that make sense to them. And sometimes their imagination leads them down paths that are even scarier than the truth. This is one of the reasons why we need to speak about it. Just because a child isn't talking about it doesn't mean they're not thinking about it. The other thing I want to tell you is that when you provide children with information about what's going on and what's happening, you give them an opportunity to work through their feelings, to feel less isolated, to learn to trust what adults are telling them, 
to learn to trust their own perceptions of what's going on, and if it's something related to them or somebody else, to prioritize their time and to complete important tasks. The next myth is that some children do not wish to know the truth. I would say that this is a partial myth. The fact of the matter is I've never met a child that wants to be lied to, but I have met some children that don't want to know everything about what's going on. The important thing that I want to get across today is I am not advocating for a disclosure. When talking to a child, it is not about sitting them down and delivering bad news. What we are really talking about today is having a conversation with children. It is our duty as adults to lead in the opening of that conversation. That means sitting down with a child and seeing if they have any questions about what's going on. That might be for their own health, if it's the sick child, with their brother or sister's health, or with somebody else in the household or around them that is very sick. Sometimes it's just asking, do you have any questions? That's all you need to do to open up the conversation. Other times, however, I get a sense that the child does have questions but doesn't even really know to ask. When this is the case, I will often say things like, do you want to know what other children in similar situations have asked me? If they say yes, they do, I usually start off with sort of the easier questions like, why am I stuck here in hospital? Or why is the team giving me all these medications? This is a great way to start a conversation. Um, many of the children will just start speaking and answering those questions on their own. Before I start answering those questions, however, I always say to the child, is this something that you've been wondering about? Is this something that you would like to hear what the answer is? And I respect the child's wish. The other part of this is that we have to let the child take the lead in how much information she or he wants. I think about these conversations like peeling back the layers of an onion. We can go layer by layer and slowly make our way to the center, but our goal is not to get to the center, it's to go as far and as deep as the child wants to go. Remember, we are not trying to tell the child something specific. We are just opening a conversation and seeing where it goes. The next myth is that the child is too young. It is true that some children at a very young age don't fully understand the concept of death. There are many factors that have to come together as a child matures for them to fully comprehend what death means. Usually, first they learn that death occurs due to some kind of a cause, that when somebody dies, their body doesn't function anymore. Later on, they learn concepts like death is irreversible, that once the dying process has started, it's inevitable. We don't have the ability always to intervene, and that death is universal. All things that are living will eventually die. But this takes time to learn this. And so it is true that some children don't fully understand death. But what we do know is that even very young toddlers have an awareness of changes in their body or can perceive changes in those around them, whether it's brothers or sisters or their parents. When we give a child an opportunity to talk about what they feel and what they see, what we are do is allowing them to cope better. And that's a good thing. The last myth is it's best to avoid the D word or saying the words death and dying. But I want to share with you that it is always best to use concrete, accurate terms like dead, dying, and death instead of common euphemisms that we use uh, together as adults like sleeping, passed away, or gone to a better place. You can imagine if you were to tell a nine-year-old child that their sister has gone to a better place, that child might wonder, if it's a better place, why can't I go there as well? Children don't understand these euphemisms. Most adults are scared to use the terms dead or dying or death because those terms are often scary to us. But the reason why the term dead or death is scary 
is because we've all seen horror movies and difficult deaths on television. And so we associate death with scary things. But to a child that doesn't understand what dead means, it's actually more fascinating and they have a curiosity. Here's how I explain to children what dead means. When somebody dies, their body stops working and cannot start working again. Their heart stops beating, their lungs stop breathing, the person can't see, hear, smell, think, or feel anymore. This is not a scary thing. This is just a factual thing. I've shown on this slide also some books. There are many books out there written for children to start to explore these concepts of death, dying, and also of illness like cancer. This is a great way to open up the conversation and start talking about things to see if children have any questions. Okay, so now that we've addressed some of the myths, how do you answer children's questions about illness, death, and dying? I like to keep things easy, so I'm gonna give you a three-step guide. But before we get to those three steps, let's start with some key principles. First of all, always be honest. If you're not honest, it will come back to bite you. Kids will trap you and they will recognize that something you said earlier wasn't true. Always be honest, even if it's hard to be sometimes. Use simple but correct and accurate language. And finally, it's okay to say, I don't know, for those really tough questions that frankly nobody knows, like why would God let this happen? Or why is this happening to me? I love saying to children, some of these things are a mystery. We don't know the answer, but we can think about it together. This is a very supportive response. The other thing is if you really get stuck or you're not sure and you're worried that you're gonna say the wrong thing, you can say, you know what? I need some time to think about that, but I'm gonna get back to you. This is also a fair approach to difficult questions. So how do we start the conversation? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I often start by saying, what do you understand about the situation? Tell me a little bit about what's going on with you or why you're here in hospital. Or tell me a bit about what's happening with your mom or dad. Explore if they've heard anything that they don't understand. That's another great way to start things. But basically what we wanna do is encourage the child to ask questions and share their concerns. They can ask anything. This is really the goal of the conversation, just letting them know if they have any questions, I'm gonna be here to try to answer them as honestly as possible. Okay, so on to the actual steps. Step one, when a child asks me a question about their illness or somebody else's illness, is to validate. How do I do that? I repeat their question, I praise them for asking the question, and when possible, I use the child's own words. That was one of the strategies at Camp Aaron. I would stand up there in front of the audience and I'd take that pink piece of paper and I would read the question word for word to everybody. Now, it was an anonymous question. I didn't say who asked it, but I knew that there was a child out there in the audience who was feeling pretty good right now that the doctor was answering their specific question. So when a child asks me a question, I say things like, wow, that is a great question. Boy, that's a really hard one. Very interesting. Again, simply by validating, what we're doing is we are letting the child know that they are welcome to ask as many questions as they want. The conversation begins now. Okay, easy enough. Step two, is reflection, exploring the thoughts, feelings, the questions behind the question. Kids may ask something that sound one way to an adult, but means something else to the child. I'll give you an example. A child may ask the question, am I gonna have to come to the hospital for treatments forever? An adult who is thinking that maybe this child is trying to find a safe way to ask, am I going to die eventually, is making assumptions about that. It may be the case that the child is just wanting to know, how many more times do I have to come to this clinic? Kids are very concrete and we should never assume that we understand exactly what they're saying. So I always say, what do you think about that? Is that something that you've been worried about? 
Can you tell me more about why you're asking that question? Try to find out the question behind the question. Many of the times, you're going to hear what the child's thinking, and that's when you really can jump on it and offer some advice. And that brings us to our final step. That's when we give a description. That's when we explain to the child the true facts about the situation. We give them the proper language to talk about it, and we address any of the misconceptions that they have about what's going on. So let's dive a little bit deeper into how to talk about illness itself. The first most important thing is that we name the illness and describe the illness. It is very common for parents and adults to talk to children and use the term sick. Your father is sick or you're at the hospital because you're sick. And this is a natural thing because kids, even at a very early age, know the word sick, and it's not that scary. The trouble is that we use the term sick to describe all kinds of things. The child might be wondering, if this is what happens when my brother is sick, they're stuck in the hospital all the time, or they're dying, or they're di they died from their sickness, what does it mean when I get sick next? Or when they hear that their mother has come down with a cough and cold and is sick, does that mean that she is going to die? Of course not. So we need to make sure that children have the proper language to talk about the sickness. Use the words cancer, or even better, use the term leukemia so they know. Parents will say to me, but my child doesn't understand what leukemia is. And I will say to them, exactly, you get the opportunity to explain it to them in a way that's not scary so that they can understand it. And there's lots of different ways to do that. Whenever you're faced with an illness, you can look it up online or speak to experts in this field to learn more about how to explain to children about different forms of illness. We need to describe the treatments that have been tried and all that the medical team is doing to try to help that person. And finally, it's very helpful to talk to children about the signs or proof of disease progression. I will often say to a child that I'm speaking to about an illness, what kind of things have you seen that make you understand that your brother is really sick? Yep, yeah, you've noticed that they're more tired, that they're coming to the hospital more. That's right, that they have bruises on their bodies. That's actually a sign of an illness. This is a way to engage them and that they can see for themselves that things are happening and that the sick person or the person with a specific illness looks a little bit different. Okay, lastly, I want to talk about the six C's and the three W's. Up till now, we've been talking about when a child has a specific question, how to answer it. But sometimes children don't have specific questions. We're just having a conversation. And once you build that relationship with the child, I would say that even if the child isn't asking specific things, there are certain things we want to get across to them. Make sure that we are talking about. And that's what we call the six C's and the three W's. Here are the six C's that we're going to go over slide by slide. What's it called? Did I cause it? Can I catch it or give it to others? Can I cure it? Who will take care of me? And will I always be connected to the people I care about? What's it called? We just talked about this one. I'm not going to go over it again, but I'm just going to re-emphasize that we need to make sure that children who themselves have an illness or someone in their life has an illness understands the name of this illness and we can explain it in a non-scary way. This way, we are not talking about euphemisms, we're not whispering things, everybody is talking openly, and it's much easier. The second one is, did I cause it? Children often think that the world revolves around them, especially young children. They think that things are happening because of their behaviors or things that they do. And we have to explain that some things are just out of their control in terms of causation and their ability to fix it. We'll talk about that one momentarily. I'll give you an example. I once worked with a child who told me that he believed 
he caused his parents, his mother's throat cancer. And I asked him, where did you get such an idea? He said to me, you know, Dr. Rappaport, I misbehave a lot and my mother often yelled at me and I know that as a result of this, she got cancer in her throat. Can you imagine the guilt that that child must have been carrying around? And who knows how long it might have gone for if I didn't explore that issue with them and have the opportunity to explain that this is not how people get cancer and that there was nothing that you could have done to cause this. This is something that happened for other reasons. The next one, and I think this is even more important after COVID, is can I catch it? Lots of children learn early on that many illnesses are contagious. They can be passed on from one another. And as a result of this, some kids might be scared when someone in their life is very sick or when they themselves are sick. They might worry that they can pass it on to the people around them that they love. Or healthy children might worry that if they go hug grand grandpa who's nearing the end of their life, maybe they're going to get sick. It's very important that adults explain to them when a serious illness is not communicable, when it's not contagious, that this is the case, that they are welcome to go and give hugs and cuddle and spend time with the person. It is safe to do so and nobody is gonna catch this. Can I cure it? We talked about that children often believe that they are causing things, but they often also believe that it's in their power to fix things. Children want to often make things better. I once met a sibling who told me that they were very convinced that next weekend their brother's cancer was going to get better. And I said, that's wonderful. Tell me, why are you so sure that next weekend this is going to happen? And she told me that the next weekend is an event that we have in Toronto every week called the Journey to Conquer Cancer. This is a walk or a run that some people do to raise money so that we can learn more and do research and provide better care for people with cancer. But this child thought that the purpose of the walk was to conquer cancer, to beat it. And this child thought, if I do this journey from start to finish, if I can make it all the way across, I am gonna cure my my sister's cancer. It's a lovely thought, but we need to explain to children that it is not in their power to fix somebody else's illness or their selves. That in fact, there are healthcare providers like doctors and nurses and the whole healthcare team that are there to do their best to try to help someone. We also have to remember that this is true around prayer. Parents will often say to children, it's really important that you pray for yourself or pray for your brother or sister or pray for your father. I have nothing against prayer. I think it's a wonderful thing. It gives us hope and it is a very important thing to do when someone's sick. But we should never make a child feel that it is up to them to fix the problem. As we all know, God works in mysterious ways. Even when God hears our prayers, he has reasons for doing things that don't always make sense to us. If a child's prayers do not come true, they may think that they were the reason why their brother died or why they are themselves dying. We need to make sure that they understand that's not always the case. The next one is who will take care of me? This one is probably more relevant for older children who often think like adults. And they might be wondering as treatments start to fail, is the doctor gonna say to me, I'm sorry, I have no care left to offer? We need to make sure that young people understand that even when healthcare providers don't have treatments for the disease, we're always gonna provide care to them or to the other people in their lives that are very sick. We will never abandon them. The other way that this one is important is if there is a young child who is in a home where a parent is nearing death. That child might be wondering, what's gonna to happen to me after my mother dies? Who's gonna look after me? That's a very frightening thing to think about. And it's something that usually adults in a home where someone is dying have already figured out. It is something that we can address and make sure they know 
that even if one of their parents dies, someone will always be there to care for them. And finally, will I always be connected to the people I care about? When a child themselves gets very sick, they often have to spend prolonged times in the hospital, and they are immediately cut off from the supports in their life that give them the most meaning. Their siblings, their classmates, their friends, their teammates. One of the things that we do in pediatric palliative care is we remind the child that just because they're in hospital doesn't mean that we have to fully break those connections. And in fact, in this day and age, there are easier ways than ever to stay connected. We can send text messages, we can connect with one another over social media, we can do FaceTime. There are lots of ways to connect. And of course, there are in-person visits as well. These are very powerful ways to help a sick child get through a difficult time regardless of their prognosis. And you know what? It's great for the other people as well who want to visit them and want to know how can I help. It's sort of a win-win situation. The other part of this C, connected, can often come around uh, thinking about what's going to happen to me and is my family going to remember me after I die? How will they stay connected to me? Some of the most powerful conversations I've had with children is wondering what happens to a person after they die and thinking about how we are going to remember them if, we, if we're talking about losing someone in their life or if it's about the child themselves, how they want to be remembered. I've had many children who, once they understand that they're dying, have come up with lots of great ideas that they have shared with their family about how they want to be remembered. As an example, I had one child that said to their family, every year on my birthday, I want you all to wear purple because that's my favorite color. You have to order a pepperoni pizza because that's my favorite and I want you to watch my favorite movie together. It's one way of saying you will always be remembered and never forgotten. Okay, so that's the six C's. What about the three W's? The first one is wonders, and we've been talking about that since slide number one. This is just remembering that once we start talking to children, we wanna give them an opportunity to Tell us what they're wondering about, anything at all, whether it's a specific question like why am I here in hospital or why do I need this medicine or the bigger wonders like why is this happening to me? Why am I the only person that seems to be experiencing such bad things? Whatever the wonder is, we can think about it together with the child and everything is open for discussion. The second W is worries. We need to ask the child, is there anything at all that you're worried about? Now, most of the time, if a child admits that they're worried about something, caring adults will say, oh, honey, you don't have to worry about that. Everything's going to be okay. And again, while this is meant to be a very supportive statement, unfortunately, what it does is it tells the child sometimes, we are not going to talk about this. This is out of bounds. You are left to deal with those worries alone. I can tell you that when I was a child, if someone told me not to worry about something, it never made me stop worrying. It just made me know that I can't talk about it with them. The last W is wishes. Always make room for wishes and ask the child, once they do have a better understanding of what's going on, what are they hoping for? What matters most to them? What do you wish for? It may be that they're wishing for things that may never come true, like a miracle, or that things are going to get better for themselves or for that other person in their lives. That's okay. We can be honest with children about what's happening and hope for miracles. These things can coexist. The truth is that many of us hope for things all the time that aren't going to happen. I don't do it as much anymore, but there was a time in my life that I bought a lottery ticket every week. I knew in my heart that I wasn't going to win that lottery, but I can tell you that I loved dreaming and thinking about what I was going to do with all that money when I won, even though I knew it wasn't going to happen. There's nothing wrong with wishing for things that may not come true. It's what gets us through the tough times when someone's really sick. So as far as take-home messages go, there are three main points I want to emphasize. First of all, I hope you've 
come to learn that kids cope better when they are given honest information. The second thing is that we are not talking about forcing children to hear and discuss death. We're simply providing them with opportunities to talk about the things that they want to talk about. And if it should go all the way to death and dying, to continue to talk about those things as well. And lastly, I want you to remember to, when you have the opportunity to sit down with a child and speak with them, address those six C's and the three W's. Try to speak about these things so children have a better understanding. Lastly, I want to leave you with a quote from Dr. Wendy Harpum, who is a physician in Texas and a cancer survivor and a parent, who said, the greatest gift you can give your children is not protection from change, loss, pain, or stress, but the confidence and tools to cope and grow with all that life has to offer them. Thank you very much.